present. I'm going to start today by uh, giving you a little background of the National Digital Elevation Program, or NDEP, and then uh, talk about the National Enhanced Elevation Assessment that NDEP uh, conducted to uh, gather requirements for the development of 3DEP. Then I'll go into talking about what 3DEP uh, is and its products and services, uh, data acquisition and inventory strategies. Uh, give you a little bit uh, information about what the budget looks like uh, right now. And then at the end, I'll give you some resources so you can stay updated on the implementation of 3DEP and, and get some more information if, if you'd like to have it. Well, the USGS uh, has a rich background of creating topographic maps for the entire country uh, that in later years we scanned and rasterized to produce the first digital elevation models, or DEMs. And today, for 72% of the 48 contaminous states in Hawaii and the territories, the best publicly available data now are the 10-meter DEMs uh, through the NED. And these were developed from the topographic maps. And so uh, because they were developed from the topographic maps, the net data, um, almost all of the data sets are 30 years old or older. So a little bit how we made the DEMs originally. Um, once the, during the compilation process of the maps, what we did and uh, I did a lot of this myself. I'm kind of dating myself here. Uh, but in the compilation process of the topographic maps, the contours were drawn uh, from a stereo plotter, using a stereo plotter, and then we hand scribed the contour lines uh, with a scribing needle. And this created a negative plate, or what we call map separates, that were, uh, that were scanned and uh, then interpolated uh, using a grid over those, uh, over those contour lines and uh, once they were scanned and digitized. And then those points were interpolated, uh, like for example on a 10 meter grid, uh, these were interpolated as the elevation. So the first seamless uh, data set or NED data, uh, seamless DEMS, was a resolution of 30 meter. It was a 30 meter grid posting. Um, I'm sure you're probably all familiar with that data set. And now, of course, we have the 10 meter DEMS. And I, I think this is a really good uh, image that John Kosovich uh, here at the National Technical Operations Center put together to really show the difference in the resolutions. And um, so here's the various uh, grid postings, the 30 meter in red, the 10 meter in uh, yellow, and then the 2 meter. Actually, that's a 1 meter. I don't know why that says 1. I guess I didn't get it changed. <laughs> the slide got uh, messed up and I had to redo it. Uh, anyway, it gives a really good perspective if you think about this, uh, the, that these grid cells are represented by a flat surface. So if you look at the 30 meter, you can understand that how much uh, terrain is really lost here, what the values are kind of lost in there. Um, so it gives you a perspective of how smaller, the smaller areas like the one meter grid would give you a lot better resolution in the resulting elevation model. This is a slide that talks about, uh, about the LIDAR and how it's collected. And I think uh, probably most of you know that LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. And um, the laser scanner sends out pulses uh, about a minimum of 1,000 pulses per second. And there's multiple potential for multiple returns from each of these pulses. And it's the timing of these pulses that gives us the elevation value. 
And this is another really great slide that uh, John Kosovich put together. And it really does a good job of showing you um, that LIDAR data isn't just, doesn't just result in a lot higher resolution DEM. It um, actually gives us a really good 3D rendering. And the gridded uh, LIDAR uh, DEMs, the one at the top, which is the DSM, uh, the surface model or the canopy height model, and the bottom one, which is the LIDAR digital terrain model or, or bare earth model. Uh, that bare earth model, I'll say here, is pretty, it's pretty much what our DEMs are now. It's just a bare earth model. And then if they, these two gridded models don't really give you the, a real good 3D representation. And the middle image there is the LiDAR point cloud. And as you can see, the, the, it's the full uh, 3D image. This is a slide that was uh, produced by the NRCS. And uh, I think we all know that LiDAR improves data quality. It's pretty obvious. Uh, but on the left-hand side is a 10-meter resolution DEM from the NED. Uh, and then on the right is the two meter resolution derived LIDAR DEM. And NRCS um, is using this uh, LIDAR data to be able to utilize uh, or provide farm planning assistance. And most often with the LIDAR data, they don't even need to do a site visit. So that's, of course, very uh, cost beneficial to them for their business practices. You can really see the terracing and the water catchments there. And I have some more examples of uh, the 10 meter dams versus the new LIDAR dams. And this is um, a 10 meter dam from the NED of a certain uh, area. And then here is the one meter uh, derived LIDAR uh, model. Um, obviously a, a very big difference. And here's um, a tile of 10 meter NED from San Luis Valley uh, area that we flew LIDAR last year of. And here is the 10 meter LIDAR dem that was derived from it. So as you can see, both of these are 10 meter dems. Um, and this one, uh, like I was mentioning before, was derived it's the NED, so it was derived from uh, interpolating the contour lines on a grid to produce it. And then this one, of course, is from the LIDAR, and we're, we have very, very good um, you know, pulse returns, at least two per uh, you know, elevation values derived per meter. So you can see how even though these are the same scale DEM, the detail is, is just much, much more. Oh, and then here's just one more example uh, of the great sand dunes. And this is the, the pre-LIDAR uh, dam, and this is the post-LIDAR dam. Pretty dramatic. This is a status map of, uh, of where the NED is right now. This, is uh, current of about five months ago. And I think it's a really good example. It kind of lets these facts be known here that, um, you know, that we're, that this data is uh, getting pretty old. It's, uh, as you see the source date there on the right in the legend, um, it really shows how we had this ad hoc approach to collecting data in the past. and how old the data really is. So the OMB circular A16, um, I, I'm sorry, I, my, my slides are kind of out of back here. Sorry about that. The uh, circular A16 um, from Office of Management and Budget names the USGS as the lead for the terrestrial elevation data. Uh, and in this role, the USGS has managed the NED and uh, coordinated acquisition 
through the uh, through the NDEP on a project by project basis for more than 15 years. And with the new technologies and the rapidly developing applications for the technologies, we are now at a point in the data life cycle for defining uh, the next generation national elevation program. And this is where the slide should have been to, to really uh, show you that this is, this is really true. So the end up um, to move forward in uh, defining the next generation elevator pro program really needed to understand what the requirements are uh, out there in the user community so we could build this program. So they initiated uh, the National Enhanced Elevation Assessment. Uh, it was initiated in 2010 uh, and completed in 2011. And the project was sponsored, or the assessment was sponsored by uh, the member agencies of, of NDEP, and USGS conducted it with a company called Dewberry Incorporated, and it was funded by the USGS, NGA, FEMA, NRCS, and NOAA. And the intent of the assessment was to document national requirements for LIDAR and NSTAR data. Uh, and estimate the benefits and costs of meeting those requirements within a national program. And then to evaluate multiple national program scenarios that would, could be derived from uh, the assessment, uh, considering data quality, uh, update frequency, geographic coverage, uh, and the uh, geographic coverage um, in order to optimize the benefits. I'm going to talk a little bit about data qualities here in a little bit. 34 agencies, all 50 states and territories, uh, some select nonprofit uh, industry, local governments, and tribes all participated in the assessment. And from the assessment, we documented 602 functional activities with requirements for the enhanced elevation data and identify the requirements and expected benefits, again, assuming that this needs to be met by a, a national program. And the study actually determined that um, 100, yeah, 1.2 billion to 13 billion in new benefits could be uh, realized each year. Um, but because many of the uh, participating uh, participants uh, in the assessment really couldn't come up with a money value. We asked them for a range uh, of projected benefits, and uh, really many of them couldn't, couldn't do that for us. So we're thinking that this is probably a, a real, what do I want to say, conservative uh, estimate. And as of the 602 uh, functional activities identified, we summarized them into 27 uh, business use categories. And this slide uh, represents six of the top ones. And I'll give a few examples of the uh, functional activities that we summarized into each one of these, these uh, top business uses. For agriculture and precision, uh, farming was optimizing yields and reducing harmful runoff by site-specific applications of fertilizers and pesticides, and optimizing farm practices. For land navigation safety, railroad grade safety and assets management, asset management, in-car navigation products and services, future intelligent navigation innovations to increase fuel efficiency. Under geologic resource assessment and hazards mitigation, detailed geologic mapping to understand and mitigate landslides, seismic and volcano risk to infrastructure and populations. Natural resource conservation, uh, functional activities included conservation engineering, soils mapping, wetlands mapping and characterization, as assessment of biological carbon stock. Under infrastructure and construction management, military base and facility feasibility and planning, design and placement of infrastructure, transmission line vegetation management. 
And then for flood risk management, uh, obviously flood risk analysis and floodplain mapping, emergency management, levee safety, flood forecast, hydrologic and uh, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. This is a slide uh, or table that shows the top business uses ranked by the total benefits identified. Uh, and when the benefits were identified as a range, the conservative number represents the lower end of the range and the potential number uh, represents the high end of the range that, that they provided for us. With the exception of the potential benefit of $7 billion associated with land navigation, all of the dollar benefits re represent immediate needs. The land navigation benefit uh, and safety benefit was uh, realized from vehicle fuel reductions that can be achieved by intelligent uh, vehicle navigation that I mentioned before, uh, these systems that are beginning to appear on the market. So this slide uh, has a graph that, uh, that shows the, uh, the 10 scenarios that were developed out of the assessment. That gives a little snapshot here. And if you look at the far left, uh, where the highest quality level is quality level one, the highest quality level, and it's on a yearly cycle. And of course, this would meet 98% of the identified needs. But as you can see, the cost benefit, uh, the cost of it way outweighs the benefits. Um, and then on the other end of the graph is uh, the program that is pretty much the program that we have been working under uh, to this prior to the assessment. And that is a quality level three on a 25-year cycle. And, you know, of course, we think we can do a lot better than that, that it's only meeting 13% of the needs. So the median uh, program there is what uh, is the recommended program. And it's quality level two on an eight-year cycle. And it meets 58% of the assessed needs and will result in a cost benefit of almost five to one if you calculate the annual average cost of 146 million to the average benefits of 690 million. So as I said, uh, the recommended program is a quality, uh, uniform quality level two LIDAR for the conterminous United States Hawaiian territory on an eight year cycle. And Quality level five IFSAR data for Alaska. And I guess I should say here, um, the reason that, there's a few reasons why LIDAR is not, um, will not be, will not be collected in Alaska. There's a lot of reasons that it kind of prohibits LIDAR from being flown. And one of those is the fact that the cloud cover issue uh, IFSAR can see through clouds. Um, IFSAR stands for Intraferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, and it can see through clouds where LIDAR can't. So that's one of the, the main reasons. So, and one of the, uh, the important parts of the program is that this data is going to be, uh, and its products, services will be publicly accessible. And the goal of the program is to be operational in January of 2015. And I've included uh, the quality level uh, table here that I uh, said I would talk about earlier. And what I wanted to point out is that quality level three here is the program that we have been working under uh, so far. And it results in a, 30, a three meter uh, resolution dem posting uh, DEM, and we will be moving, of course, at the quality level two to a one meter. And here's the five meters that will result from the quality level five or the IFSAR data for Alaska. 
So here's a table. I, I know this is pretty um, complicated to put on a slide, but um, I can provide this uh, this list to to maybe Sally, and uh, it can get posted somewhere for you uh, to be able to see if you would like to see it in more detail. Um, what I really wanted to point out here is that uh, these products here that say they're from the National Map now, these are our legacy NED products that we have out there, elevation products. And we're moving to this one meter uh, and five meter for Alaska. And this chart talks about the, the source for each of the data um, and what the product the deliverable product is and the plan availability, where to get it, and when the uh, product release dates are. So for the one major DEMs, we're going to be serving that through the national map. They'll be available in January of 2015. And that's the new data that we've collected since April. Um, and that's because Eros Data Center and Earth Explorer were uh, serving the data, and now it's going to be um, served through the national map. So in that tr um, transition, you know, we're going to start serving the one meter de DEMs in 2015. But the ones that we have previous, one meter DEMs that we've collected previously uh, will um, we're not sure when they're going to be able to be in the national map because the transition hasn't hasn't taken place yet. So they could possibly be there uh, in 2015 as well. So this is um, we're going to be serving also. This is uh, you know our new products and services. Um, and this is the information about the uh, lidar source data. And we are going to be uh, serving the LiDAR point cloud um, starting in October. Uh, right now you can get to them through the Earth Explorer Air Center, but they will all be uh, available in October this year uh, through the national app, as well as the IFSAR uh, digital surface model for Alaska. Uh, this is just a slide uh, showing the point cloud um, and the announcement that they will be available through the national map in October. I just thought it was a pretty picture. <laughs> uh, because we've had uh, previously this real ad hoc sort of process with the separate agencies working with various project level acquisitions. Uh, data acquisition is another big topic that we are revamping with our partners. And in order to make the acquisition process more visible to and inclusive of the broader user community, we need to implement a process where priorities are broadcast um, in order to develop some, some good partnership opportunities. So I guess this is sort of a outline or steps, if you will, for this process. And the first step is to solicitate uh, priorities from the NDEP agencies and state plans from the states. Uh, in this first step, we want to obtain plans and priorities over the next three years if possible so we can leave enough time uh, to allow for more partnerships. The submitted pro uh, <coughs> excuse me. These submitted priorities will be analyzed uh, comparing the baseline coverage in the U.S. interagency elevation inventory, which I'll talk here uh, a bit about in a minute. Um, and we'll do those against the prioritization, uh, along with the prioritization, I can't say the word, prioritization criteria, which includes things like producing data where there isn't any coverage, uh, replacing older and lower quality coverage. And we'll also be seeking larger project areas since the cost of 3 deck is predicated uh, on a national program where we're acquiring large areas and receiving an economy scale for, for doing that. And it's estimated that we would save about 25% over the cost of acquisition 
by doing that. So through the process, we'll uh, develop joint priorities for new acquisitions uh, and a review and approve the plan among the NDEP partners. And once the plan has been approved, a broad agency announcement will be made. Uh, this will come from our contracting group that will officially announce the opening of the solicitation proposals uh, for the data acquisition partnerships. And we're going to be able to combine, uh, do a combination of U.S. data acquisition by using our geospatial products and services contract or GYPSI contracting mechanism, um, as well as being able to contribute to uh, our partners when they're uh, going to do some acquisition. And once the proposals have been accepted, we will acquire and distribute, distribute the data. I know that's sort of a just kind of blunt <laughs> overall statement, but uh, it's kind of devoid of details at this point because the process is really still being worked out. And so, you know, our intention of rolling out uh, the program in FY15, we know that uh, we're going to have some challenges and that as we move forward, we'll be able to, to work through them uh, with all of the partners and uh, user community to try to get that more refined. So I said I was going to talk about uh, the elevation inventory. And I know by looking at this, this is um, a status map as of August of uh, last year. And it, it, although it looks like we got some good coverage started, 38% uh, of the 49 states has coverage, but only 4% meets the three depth goal of quality to level two or better. Like I was saying, um, we were really collecting uh, at the quality level three um, prior to the assessment and to the development of the three depth program. Uh, and for Alaska, well, we still need more than half of the ISTAR to be complete uh, to meet the three depth goal coverage. Oh, and if you're interested in looking uh, more at the inventory and seeing the inventory, I've left the, uh, I have the link to it right there at the bottom of the slide, and I'll provide that in the resources um, that I'm going to provide later as well. So this slide adds a little more perspective on the status of the three depth goals at this point. It shows uh, just the LIDAR that we acquired in 2013. And 6% of the nation was acquired, but that's at all of the quality levels. And you can see um, in the legend there um, that only the, the darker green is the actual quality level two that meets the three depth. Uh, specifications. So we really need to be acquiring, um, you know, 12% each year for those eight years of quality level two or higher, and um, and the quality level five in Alaska to meet the three depth national coverage goals. So on to the budget outlook. Um, this is the subject that really eludes me. Um, I just, the, the whole process, I just, you think I have 31 years of working for the federal government, I really understand the budget process by now, but I, I still don't have a grip. So I stole this, uh, or excuse me, borrowed this uh, slide from a presentation that Vicki Lucas, who is the lead for the 3 debt program for USGS, um, uh, presented a couple of weeks ago. And um, obviously, uh, actually, I've borrowed some dialogue uh, from her presentation as well. Um, we really get a lot of questions about the budget and what it's looking like. Um, because it's a collaborative program, the USGS has never had any thoughts that the $146 million investment needed annually would come from the USGS budget or come into the USGS budget. And we see it as something that's going to be spread across uh, multiple federal budgets and, um, and other budgets. 
we do want to see that the program hopefully uh, will be increased to a level where we'll be able to facilitate the partnerships um, to get a systematic coverage going at a faster rate. Uh, we don't know clearly what, uh, at this point, what that number um, is that we would really need to do that, but we're thinking the neighborhood of about 30 to 50 million. So for the FY14 uh, President's budget, the USGS did have an increase of 9 million for 3DEP and 1 million for Alaska IFSAR, um, uh, but we did not get that in the omnibus, uh, but it resulted in six, 760K for Alaska and 1 million in coastal marine geology. And uh, it matched for the coastal national elevation data set, which does support 3DEP. And we feel like this is a, a step in the right direction, at least. A whole lot of work goes into the getting a budget increase. It goes from our program, through the Bureau, through the Department of the Interior, through Office of OMB, and then back down again. So um, we'd like to say that this is really a positive, um, you know, for 3 dep It was a realize, at least on the executive side of the budget equation, uh, but we still have a lot of, a lot of work to get that, that ball across the line. We did receive quite a few endorsements, as you can see listed here, uh, quite a few letters of budget support. So as we move into FY15's pres uh, president's budget, the USGS has $5 million identified for 3 dap and other pots of monies are called up for specific areas of the country, such as Alaska, uh, Columbia River, and the Puget Sound. Uh, we hope this will be enacted by Congress. It could actually actually be increased. It just depends on what happens between now and when we get that budget. Uh, because of sequestration and the overall budget picture over the past few years, I mean, we've been seeing decreases everywhere. Um, having a budget of increase of, of any, uh, anything is good news. So we're just hoping, of course, it passes the legislative uh, side of the how uh, of Congress through appropriations. Uh, this last bullet here, uh, Vicki added to the slide to point out another positive note that happened. The Napa report that was released last year, late last year, uh, contained a report from FEMA, uh, and that addressed the coordination of flood mapping, and it included a recommendation, um, and the quote is. The Office of Management and Budget should use the 3 dep implementation plan for nationwide elevation data collection to guide the development of the President's annual budget request. So obviously that's a pretty strong show of support for the program. I included this slide, I, I kind of put this together last night. Um, and. I was made aware of uh, this this uh, lighter that was being flown um, recently, and uh, I had to go online and I went to National Geographic to get more information. Uh, I looked up what the Minute 319 was about, uh, but it was kind of hard to, to to really get into the real meat of, of what the project is, and so I went to National Geographic. Uh, and I've got the link right down there um, that has articles about it. But Minute 319 uh, is an add-on to the 1944 uh, water treaty between the U.S. and Mexico uh, that divides the Colorado River between the, the two nations. And the Minute 319 uh, is allowing Mexico to store some water in Lake Mead. Um, and it establishes new uh, sharing sh uh, during times of shor uh, shortages or in drought, times of drought. And the, it, this 319 commits uh, us to return some flow to the delta um, in Mexico. And the Colorado Delta uh, in Mexico is once one of the planet's greatest desert uh, 
aquatic ecosystems. It was boosting, sorry, boasting two million acres of lush wetland habitat. Um, and for millions of years, it received a huge spring flood as the winter snow melted in the Rocky Mountains and resorted, resulted in the flows um, as they went south. But uh, now that there has been, you know, so much damming and, um, you know, diversions of the water, uh, the delta is, is now pretty much, um, you know, a, a dry desert. And so this initiative, this 319, um, is, is releasing water um, from Lake Mead uh, to flow south. And this, this three in this 319, they're going to be releasing and they water from um, the dam. Oh, gosh. It's, can you remember the name of the dam now that's in Mexico, where it's just been receiving the water? And, Morales. Oh, thank you. Is, is this Matt? No, this is Larry. I work for IBWC, and I've worked on the Minute 319 project. Oh. It's Morales Dam. I was hoping that somebody would be on there to sort of help me fill in here. Um, if, you know, if you can speak to this, that would be really great. You would know a lot more than I do. Well, IBWC, even though it's been our money that's been involved in the project, we're kind of on the sidelines with it. But uh, one of our uh, people just came back. They did a pulse. What they're looking at is they did a pulse release uh, a few weeks ago and then tracked the progress of the, of the waters that went through the, uh, the riverbed, the dry riverbed. And the idea is that they're going to be looking uh, periodically, in fact, using Landsat occasionally, uh, to look at what kind of revegetation they see and what uh, plant life, uh, animals, and so on um, can be will, will be seen as a result of the poles. And if the flow is successful in regenerating a certain amount of vegetation, uh, it may be repeated in the future. It's not guaranteed that this will happen again, but that's the that's the plan right now. Oh, great! Thank you so much. Well, we uh, we collected um, uh, the Bureau of Rec uh, funded a lidar collection of uh, the area that you see right there uh, that goes along the border, it's about 132 square miles along the border um, and down uh, into into the delta, and they did a pre-event uh, collection. Um, I, they started releasing water, uh, Larry, I think, uh, I, they said it was um, March 23rd, I think. And that sounds it, right. And then it's supposed to end um, May 18th, but I found out this morning that um, I, I don't know if that's actually, uh, if they're going to, to let it go a bit longer than that. Um, anyway, uh, once it's the, the pulse stops, uh, we're going to collect LIDAR again um, over the area. So we have the comparison of what, what has taken place. So these are the three depth resources I was telling you about. Um, on the site that I have down there below, the nationalmap.gov slash 3 dep that's the 3 dep uh, site, program site. And there we have uh, links to the NIA report. We have fact sheets about NIA uh, and the uh, 3D elevation program itself. There's about to be a new release, kind of updated fact sheet about the 3D, uh, about 3 dep uh, coming out real soon. and It'll be posted on that site. Um, and also, we're, we're doing uh, state summaries from uh, the states, how they reported, uh, what their business uses are um, for LIDAR, and the benefits, and all those things that came out uh, from the NIA, NIA study. Uh, we, we're developing fact sheets for each state. And I think most of them uh, are out there and available now. Um, also, the interagency elevation inventory, which has been 
Uh, the first one was uh, in 2011 uh, for the report and for the, uh, the NIA assessment. And then we've been updating it every year since. And uh, we just completed uh, the 2013 update. Um, and then I've, I'll put a link here to the Geospatial Liaison Network. I, um, it's kind of hard to get through the national map to, to that, you know, that um, the list of geospatial liaisons. So if you have some questions about 3DEP, um, feel free to contact the liaison uh, for the particular state um, because they have a, a really good idea of what uh, LIDAR data exists now and what plans are uh, by the states to um, collect collect more and about their participation uh, in the 3 debt process. So that's what I have. Um, if you have questions or comments. Thank you so 